papers and chapters on his topics. He also has um, had some close up practical experience with education, uh, in particular he taught at a high school, taught a class on race uh, at a local high school and also wrote a book about that. Today's talk is going to be drawn from his most recent book, which is just out, uh, which is called Integrations with an S. And let's welcome Professor Buck. Thank you, Adam. I'm very, very pleased to be here. I'm going to take my mask off because of the six foot rule. It's just, oh, that's okay. So, um, the, the book, this is what it looks like, is about two different things that are often talked about as if they weren't two different things. One is integration, and one is equality, specifically in education. You all have you have a handout? Okay. So I'll start by defining integrationism. This is somewhat stipulative, but the word is sometimes used this way. And integrationism is the view that integration is the key to creating racial equality in education. And I'm going to argue that there are three problems with this. I'm actually going to only talk about two of them. The first is that it diverts from the real requirements of in-school equality, which involves egalitarian policies regarding factors outside the school, health, income, and wealth, housing, and occupation. The second, which I'm not going to talk about today, is that it encourages a view that my co-author and I call the capital view, which is that students of color benefit educationally from proximity to advantaged students and their family's social, cultural, and financial capital. And the third, which I will talk about today, is that integration masks, integration is, I'm sorry, masks the real source of integration's value in education, which is that it provides an essential setting for civic purposes of education. Okay, so to the argument. So I want to start with the separate and unequal tradition and start with the case of Plessy versus Ferguson. I, I heard on the radio on the way over, this is 125th uh, anniversary of that decision. And the state of Louisiana is doing something to recognize it, but I missed what it is they're doing. So as you probably know, Plessy versus Ferguson articulated the idea of separate uh, but equal. Obviously the whole idea of separate but equal was a complete fraud. But what made it a fraud was that the separate facilities that were given to blacks and whites were never actually equal. But that didn't prove that they couldn't ever be equal, only that they never were equal. So there's kind of two different aspects of the equality in question. One is a kind of resource-based equality where you know, separate groups are occupying different uh, Sorry. Um, 
separate groups have kind of different facilities. Those facilities can be made to be equal through their resources. But also there's another aspect of equality, which is that under the Jim Crow segregation uh, regime, Blacks were regarded and stigmatized as an inferior race. And the separate, the separateness of them, like in Homer Plessy's, um, you know, the train car of the Plessy was riding in, assigning Blacks to a separate place was seen as expressing that stigma. But the stigma wasn't created by the separation. The stigma already existed as part of the official ideology, essentially, of the Jim Crow segregation era. And then the separateness was um, an expression of that, of that sense of stigma. So of course, as long as you've got a system in which one group is stigmatized, you can't have full equality, even if you have resource equality, because that group is seen as a, a, an inferior uh, group. Later, I would be now, later, at sort of building up to the Brown decision in 1954, many Southern states or some Southern states attempted to provide some kind of equal resources for Blacks as a way of staving off integration. So I, I didn't have time to sort of get these cases down, but there was one case where a state built a separate law school for Blacks that, <laughs> instead of allowing Blacks to come to the white law school. And sometimes when those cases uh, came to the Supreme Court, or maybe it was also at lower, lower levels, the judges ruled that even though there's a sense in which the resources were equal in that you could say, um, they spent the same amount for the buildings and paid the teachers the same amount, something like that, um, that there were what were called imponderables. So for example, a student who went to the black law school would not be part of the kind of networks of people in the law and lawyers that the people who went to the white ones were. So that was an inequality that was a kind of resource, but it wasn't like a monetary resource exactly. And so these, um, you know, th those cases were, I, I think by and large, were, were struck down and the states were required to do something more towards equality. And of course, then in 1954, a bunch of education cases were bundled together and they're called Brown versus Board of Education. And, and so to get to that, um, the, the Brown case, has what I see as, I mean, the Brown case is tremendously important, tremendous, tremendous step forward in declaring the legal foundation of Jim Crow segregation to be unconstitutional. But I, I think there were two unfortunate legacies of, of, of Brown. The first one is that they addressed uh, this stigma problem that I mentioned by saying that separate is un inherently unequal. And what that meant really was, if you have a stigma out there, then if you consign one group to a, to a separate you know, uh, situation, they will, that assigning as separate is gonna be interpreted by the, having the social meaning of consigning that group to inferiority. But the, what the, uh, what the opinion didn't do was to directly challenge the stigma and say that the stigma was wrong and that states couldn't adopt as a, they couldn't adopt, you know, a racist philosophy. And so they rendered invisible the possibility of a separation that was equal in resources and didn't have a stigma system surrounding it. So that would be a case where you could have a separate but equal if you got rid of the stigma and if you made the resources genuinely equal, including the more subtle resources of the, of the imponderables I mentioned. So the Brown decision sort of left out the possibility that there could be, you know, so like suppose you have a black 
school, an all black school, that's like a really terrific school. There can be a terrific school that are, it's all black. Many, there are many all black schools that are. But by saying that separate is inherently unequal, you kind of imply that a, a black school is always gonna be problematic. And that association has continued till today, it seems to me. A second problem is that Brown assumed, the Brown decision assumed that equality can be created through in-school processes alone. That is, by bringing blacks and whites into the same school, you create equality. That was the implication of their decision. So now to point D, the Coleman report in 1966 blew that uh, view out of the water because what the, the Coleman report was a report commissioned as part of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And it, um, the report came out in 66 and it, it had this finding that people were like really kind of blown away by at the time, which is that it showed that students' economic resources, their families' economic resources had an impact on how well the students did in school. Of course, the students also learn things in school. It's not that they didn't learn anything, but that the inequalities outside the school had an impact on students' performance. So that view rejects, I'm not saying they explicitly rejected from this point about Brown, but it rejected the view that's implied in Brown that you um, can, can create equality purely through an in-school process itself. Okay. Uh, two, I have two number twos here, it doesn't matter, but anyway. So what is, so moving to defining integration, I think integration has had three different um, historical meanings into the present. So these are all in a certain sense valid meanings, but because of the ambiguity between them, it, it, it sort of confuses conversations. One is uh, desegregation which is getting rid of the structures of legal segregation that assign students of different races to different schools. So that's what the Brown decision said was constitutionally required. I wrongly say unconstitutional. It's the opposite of what I said here. I know that's not a very helpful thing to have in the handout. So it, the uh, you know, Brown decision declared desegregation to be constitutionally required. And that is one, one meaning of the word integration is desegregation. A second meaning much more uh, current is descriptive integration, which is simply, it's simply the fact of students of different races attending the same school. So you can say a school is integrated if students of different races attend. So that's a descriptive meaning. And then a third meaning, which we call ideal integration is a situation of descriptive integration, but with some ideals of how people in the different groups treat each other. So there's a uh, quote Martin Luther King wrote about this uh, idea of equality and let me just read a brief thing from him. He says, a desegregated society that is not integrated leads to physical proximity without spiritual affinity. It gives a society where men are physically desegregated and spiritually segregated where elbows are together and hearts are apart. So that idea, it, it kind of draws on the idea that if you just have the populations co-present, that's not really integration. So people who look at it that way move to this third uh, definition. But I think all three of them, all three of those meanings of integration are in play and name something important. And we just have to be clear which one we're talking about. Okay, so then the issue, what is the relationship between integration and equality of ed education? Of course, I'm, I'm just giving a kind of summary of the argument in the book about this. And obviously that question depends on which meaning of integration you have and which meaning of educational equality. So in the book, we develop a, a theory of educational equality, which I can really only name to you. I just don't have time to go into it in detail. And we call it the educational goods conception of equality of education. And it says that there are um, a set of educa distinctly educational goods that all students should have in their possession, so to speak, 
at the exit point of compulsory education, like what is now high school, but you know, at some point it could become two years of community college, whatever the exit point of where people are compelled to go to school, they should be in possession of these educational goods. And the, the educational goods fall into different categories. And we suggest, um, you know, sort of obvious ones like mastering the subject matter, developing certain intellectual capabilities, but we want to include moral goods as well learning respect for different people and civic goods, which have to do with the way you engage, the, the ability learning to engage with the polity that you live in, and also a good of personal flourishing. Um, it, the reason it's sort of important to mention them, even though I don't have time to discuss them, is that there has been so much emphasis on test score performance. And when people talk about how different students and different groups are doing in school, it's only the tested subjects and these moral goods and civic goods are almost never tested for. And some people argue that you couldn't actually test for them or that putting a testing regime would actually corrupt the education that attempted to, uh, you know, to, to purvey those goods to or convey those goods to, to students. Um, okay, so you can ask about that, but I have to leave it for now. So a big, so B, 3B, a big picture principle is that it's impossible to have true educational equality on the educational goods conception in a society that's as unequal in wealth, health, housing, and occupation as ours is. And so C, moving on to this, the basic cause or a fundamental cause of educational inequality is the extreme class and race resource disparities of our society, not segregated schools. So segregated schools are not the fundamental cause of educational uh, inequality. I mean, you can actually see, I put the word segregated in quote, quotes because in a certain sense, the word segregated has a kind of ambiguity in it that makes its that lends itself to being seen as kind of more significant than it is. Sometimes segregated just means separated. The different groups are separated into different um, schools or, diff if, or different classes in the same school, like under a, under a tracking system. But sometimes segregation evokes the whole system of Jim Crow segregation. So that when you say segregated schools, it's almost as if you're talking about the school system you know, back in, in 1954. And of course, there are certain comparable features of the system today, but it's still a very different social order that surrounds those uh, resource differences. Um, okay, so the, the resources um, in, in question, the resource, I, I just wanna say a little something about the resource disparities themselves. Um, and I just put them in two categories. The in-school resources refers to familiar aspects of schooling, the physical condition of the school, the quality of the teachers, the stability of the teaching force services provided in the school, all of which depend on the financial resources available to the school. Because our educational system funds schools primarily through property taxes, there's a built-in inequity in resources available to schools. Wealthier communities have better funded schools than poor and working class communities. Everyone knows this. And many people take it as almost like a fact of nature that things are going to be like that. But it didn't have to be like that. And there was a fantastic case in 1973 called the Rodriguez versus San Antonio, something like that, case that challenged the, the idea that school funding should be based on the property tax. And by a five to four decision, the judges ruled that it was all right, that it was constitutionally permissible. But by one vote, we could have had the, the uh, property tax funding system thrown out if there had, if, you know, if the <laughs> balance on the court had been, been the other way. Okay, so those are um, kind of in school uh, resources. But there's also, this is in line with the Coleman point, out of school uh, disparities, resource disparities regarding students and their families. <laughs> okay, so um, 
And the, the out of school resources and their impact on educational performance are extremely complicated. So I'm just gonna give you two examples. One is the impact of low income on, uh, on school performance. It's now very well known that the poverty of a student's family affects the student's school engagement and performance. Students in poverty tend to be less healthy, subject to mental stress from their parents not having enough income, often having housing instability, and many, many of those students are actually homeless. These and other economic related disadvantages depress school performance. The COVID regime has both highlighted and also intensified these disparities. These conditions are not the students or the parents' fault and do not deny that a student can make educational progress. Just because a poor student is disadvantaged doesn't mean they're unable to make some progress, but they just can't make as much progress. Um, okay, so that's, that's 2A, C2A. And then 2B, opportunity hoarding. Economic disadvantage is not the only class-based source of educational disadvantage, although it's the one that gets so much more policy attention. But there are also class-based processes at the top end of the income and wealth spectrum that disadvantage those below that level. Advantaged families generally engage in what has been called opportunity hoarding. The parents can buy educational enrichment, private tutors, college counselors, and the like for their offspring. They can use their class-based social skills and capital to advocate for favorable, favorable treatment for their children in the schools. As a result, wealthy students are educationally advantaged compared to their peers with less income, which is to say the economically non-advantaged, which is a much larger group than the economically disadvantaged. The economically disadvantaged is a subgroup of the non-advantaged but they are negatively, the disadvantaged are further negatively impacted beyond their poverty by the opportunity hoarding of the people at the time. This is not to say that uh, wealthy parents or advantaged parents are, are intentionally engaging in a collective educationally group advantaging project. Each parent might simply be trying to improve their own child's education. And it's not necessarily wrong of to parents to do this but they do end up collectively contributing to group opportunity hoarding that sustains educational racial injustice. Um, and so point three, one place that it's so clear about the, the class slant of the K through 12 system is if you look at selective colleges, and I can't now remember how that's defined, but it's not the very tip top, it's people, colleges that um, admit maybe less than 25%. I can't remember the exact definition of it, but anyway, at those colleges, there are as many students who come from the top 1% of the income spectrum as the bottom 50%. So just think about that for a minute. That means you're 50 times something like, you're 50 times more likely to get in if you're from the top 1% than if you're at the bottom. And that it, it can't be tracking the uh, the kind of innate potential of students if you've got that kind of income slant. So that, that's just a way of seeing what everyone knows anyway, that uh, there are these income-based and kind of wealth-based disparities that translate into educational disparities. Okay, rejoinder. So here's a rejoinder for um, to, to my argument. But white and middle-class schools do have better resources than low-income schools with predominantly black and brown students. So wouldn't it bring those students closer to equality with the white and middle-class students if they attended those same schools? So here's, here's my reply to the rejoinder. First of all, the rejoinder accepts the class and race injustices of the overall structure and does not challenge them at all. It's, it's simply saying, we have these tremendous disparities, but we can get a little bit of resources to the more disadvantaged populations by moving them into integrated schools. But they, they leave out, they leave out of consideration the injustices of the larger structure. And the rejoinder concedes that resources are the primary problem for educational equity inequality rather than integration itself. Integration is just seen as a kind 
kind of minor leverage to get some resources transferred instead of directly changing the resource regime. Um, and then point C, descriptive integration, that is bringing racially different populations into the same school would not close the resource gap even among students in the same school. So if you brought uh, more disadvantaged black and brown students into a school that's kind of a white dominated school and it becomes therefore integrated in that sense, that doesn't mean that the black and brown students are gonna have equal resources spent on them inside the school because you've already got the opportunity hoarding dimension that privileges the advantage white students or the advantage students more generally. Um, and so this, this argument, you know, this argument can't present itself as it sometimes does as an equality argument. When I stated it, I, I hedged on that a little bit. It couldn't possibly uh, bring about equality. At most it could bring about uh, benefit, but keep in mind that, you know, the definition, the definition of descriptive integration is that the groups are purely defined by race. They're not defined by economic resources. So if you're just saying we're bringing, if you, if you brought black and brown students who were of the same class as the white students who were in the integrated schools, that would be a quite different dynamic than if you brought disadvantaged black and brown students, or if you brought disadvantaged black and students into a school that was dominated by whites, but dis, whites who were equally disadvantaged to them. So generally that, that argument tends to draw, tends to kind of presuppose a resource shift that goes along with the racial population shift, but without uh, naming that. But, you know, by, by making use of, of a resource argument, it's showing that they recognize that it, it's the resources, not the racial bodies of the different populations that matter. Okay, point five. So now I want to mention a, a, a tradition of educational thought that's primarily African American, and you can trace it back to W.E.B. Du Bois's work, which is a competing way of thinking about these issues of, of kind of racial plurality and equality. So egalitarian pluralism um, advocates for equality among racialized groups. That, that is, it wants the racialized groups to be equal. So I'm sorry. I'm looking at egalitarian pluralism is a more general view of society. It's not just about education, but I'm talking about the educational version of it, so to speak. So it would be advocating educational equality between racialized groups, but also B, it also um, a, a separate point, and this is important that it's a separate point. It involves a kind of affirmation of the community experiences, history, identity and heritage of the ethno-racial groups in question. Um, so it's got both equality between the different groups, but it also has an affirmative affirmation. Sometimes this is called multiculturalist, or that's one tradition that has lifted up this idea of, of affirmation of, of group uh, particularity. But what we show in the book, in the historical part of the book that was written by my co-author Zoe Burkholder, is that if you look at the educational activism of the other BIPOC groups, Asian Americans, Latinx, and especially if you go kind of back, back in history when the, you know, like the Latinx group was primarily Mexicans with some Puerto Ricans, but Mexicans were the largest group for, for a really long time. Those groups tended to adhere at least tacitly to an egalitarian pluralism idea. They weren't, um, so point C, there, in egalitarian pluralism, there's no particular uh, commitment to integration. Integration is accepted when it's seen in the circumstances as, as you know, being something that benefits the group. Like, you know, the integrated school is the closest one to this Latinx family, and so they choose it. They're not choosing it because it's integrated. They're choosing it because it's better resourced. So integrate, there's no commitment to integration as such in, in that view. Okay, and finally, the last thing here, um, although descriptive integration is only weakly related to equal education. I mean, I didn't totally show that, but 
I'm claiming it based on the book's argument. Um, it provides a foundation for a core educational good, which is civic education. And that, that, good, that is a great good both to individual students and, but also to the society. So that's like an important feature of it's sort of thinking about education is that some things that are good for individual students, if you only focus on it as a good to an individual student, you miss a really important part of its value, which is the civic education or the, the training of future citizens to function in a productive way in a multiracial democracy. Um, um, the, the training of the next generation of citizens for multiracial democracy is a great good to the society itself. And the society has a tremendous um, investment in schools because of that. And I'm mentioning this partly because the civic purposes of education have been somewhat swept aside in the accountability era where there's so much of a focus on the tested subjects. You know, so I mentioned that civic knowledge isn't generally tested. Um, and so partly that, that gives schools an incentive to push hard on the tested subjects like math and language, but to leave the, the civic subjects aside, the civic and moral related subjects aside. Okay, so um, I just want to read a, a quote from a memo of, in the Obama administration. This is from 2011 that kind of affirms this point. Uh, this is from the Departments of Justice and Education. Quote, racially diverse schools provide incalculable educational and civic benefits by promoting cross-racial understanding, breaking down racial and other stereotypes, and eliminating bias and prejudice. So my argument is that the integrated school is the optimal setting for civic education more generally, but specifically for the aspects of civic education that touch on race. Now that isn't to say that an all white or an all black school can't engage in civic education, they can. And I don't want my argument to be taken as saying those schools, they're out to lunch. But they're limited because the co-presence of people from different racial backgrounds is really facilitates the ability to do this kind of civic education teaching uh, much more successfully. Of course, teachers have to be good at it. It doesn't automatically happen just because you have students of different racial backgrounds in the same class, there can be, you know, like a cold war or something. But, it, but teachers who are able to make use of that plurality in front of them, this is where my own high school teaching is sort of influencing what I'm saying in, in this book. There's just a tremendous um, benefit. And so, you know, I, I don't have time to sort of prove this exactly, but in the book, we have kind of three different categories of, of edu civic education, civic knowledge and understanding, commitments and competence, and civic attachments. So civic knowledge and understanding, um, just a sec. Oh yeah, here it is. So just to give an example of like a kind of civic knowledge and understanding with regard to race. Um, the ability to discern, this is a, a kind of education goal. The ability to discern patterns of systemic advantage and disadvantage. So you're teaching students to like know how to notice that there are patterns that apply to different groups. That's not something you're born with. You know, you've really got to learn how to do it. It's very, a lot of people never learn how to do that. Um, two, the ability to analyze the causes of systemic advantage and disadvantage. That's, you know, that's a really complicated, sophisticated thing, but we want high school students to be able to do some version of that. 
And three, the ability to recognize when disparities are wrong or unjust. Obviously that gets into a moral and normative thing, but I think that we want students to have a sense of justice and to know how to recognize when in inequity is unjust and when it's okay. Um, and, uh, and for another normative point, the ability to think through your own personal responsibility to deal with racial wrongs. So that's another thing which I think we want to equip students, you know, once they sort of recognize the injustice of the society that they're living in and that they're going to inherit. Um, we want them to know how to think about how to engage in, uh, you know, like what they should do about it, what their obligations to do, to do something about that are. Um, so, so again, uh, all, well, okay, so that, that was kind of a, a one, and I'll give you an example of A3. So one of the things that the public school system in the US has always, ever, ever since it got started in the 1900s, it's always been seen as a place where people of different backgrounds come together and you sort of forge a sense of a collective identity. It's you know a national identity primarily. Um, and you, you learn how to have a sense of, oh, that person and I are part of the same, there's something we share, which is that we're part of the same nation and the same national project of trying to make the society we live in better. And you know, the argument of the book is just that it's much easier to form those civic attachments across racial lines if you've got students of different racial groups inside the same classrooms. If you don't have them inside the same classrooms, it's very difficult to do that. It's not impossible to do it, but it's very difficult to do it. Um, so, okay, so these elements are better realized in descriptively integrated than one race dominant, but obviously uh, point one, B1, they're better realized in integrated schools that have some element of the, of the king idea of ideal integration that I, I mentioned a while ago. So in other words, if it's a school that's kind of already devoted to some of these Kingian ideals of integration, then obviously those ideals can, ease, can be readily recruited for use in the civic education project and sort of vice versa. I mean, if the school has committed to civic education, they can use those to sort of help realize some of the ideals of ideal integration as well. And so these, um, th that kind of means, I mean, one, one aspect of this is that if you're, if you're um, making use of the racial plurality or the ethno-racial plurality of your student population, it means you're kind of accepting aspects of what I call the egalitarian pluralist tradition. That is, you're accepting the idea that you know, like a, a Latinx student or specifically Mexican American student, that their identity is sort of important for the school to acknowledge. And not, it's important to acknowledge it about the individual student, but it's also important for the groups to be acknowledged as part of the learning process as well. And um, so, so in, in, in a sense, the, the kind, in, in a sense, this, vision of civic education is kind of tacitly accepting an element of the egalitarian pluralist uh, tradition. So, so then um, on point C, this, the civic purposes of education, like the ones that the, that the Obama, um, that Obama memo spelled out, so, some of those, and the ones the Obama, ones spelled out, you know, about better cross-racial understanding and reduction of prejudices and so on. Those are very important and they, a sort of weaker version of them has been articulated in the affirmative action cases, both the Gruder case from 2003 and the Baffey case from uh, 19, 1978. Um, they talk it's sort of in vaguer ways about understanding and non-stereotyping. It's a very thin, sort of meager understanding of those things, but they hang the whole, you know, the permission to take race into account on this fairly thin 
uh, foundation, although it's spelled out in a thin way, I'm arguing that it's actually quite a robust uh, point, um, though I don't actually think the justices fully recognize that. Um, and so to the last point, if you compare the role of sort of racial plurality in the affirmative action cases to the role of racial plurality in some of the K through 12 cases, you know, of course, Brown being, you know, the, the most important historical one of those, but in the 2007, uh, what's called the Picks case, the justices ruled that you could not take students' race into account to assign students to create integrated schools in a city. You couldn't do it. So at the, at the uh, you know, what's happened is that at the higher ed level, the justices are allowing for taking race into account. And as a K through 12 level, they're disallowing it. And often the decisions are like five to four or six to three. So there aren't very many votes in between. So in the PICS decision, for example, the, um, the uh, what's it called, the, part, the side that's against the majority? It's dissent. What, I'm sorry? Dissent. 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 The dissenting opinion in the Picks case, one of them was written by Justice Breyer, and it's a really long thing that sort of talks about all of these important moral and civic benefits of, of uh, you know, racial plurality in, in classes, but, you know, it was the minority too. So, so anyway, I, I just thought that was really interesting. Um, let me just end with just flagging something, which I'm sure many of you are aware that in something like half the state's legislatures, there has been um, legislation introduced and in 11 of them has passed that basically says that the kind of civic education about race that Zoe and I call for in this book will not be permitted in that state, won't be permitted to be taught in those states. This is an extremely alarming development that's all, you know, if I may say so, it's because the Republicans have found an issue that they think can get a lot of, uh, you know, both that they've always wanted to roll back, you know, gains of the anti-racist movement, but also to kind of mobilize their base. And unfortunately, it seems to have worked in the Virginia election to some extent. But anyway, I, I know quite a bit about those things, but they all happened after the, after the book was in production. So, uh, but I just want to say, you know, if these things are successful, it means you can't have any of the kind of education we call for in the book. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, we have time for some questions for this one. Um, so I'm from Virginia, where the term critical race theory is really controversial. So I think it's more of the term, and people don't really understand what it means. So I was wondering, like, what your interpretation of critical race theory is, and what your arguments for or against it. So I, I just want to say that um, the use of the term critical race theory in the context of this legislation is in some ways quite misleading. Mm -hmm. And so there's this, someone named Christopher Rufo, who's a conservative activist, and he basically is on record as saying, I looked around for a term that we could use as a, a, a kind of flashpoint, that people would see that term and they would think all these things that they don't like are part of that. Mm -hmm. And that's really all critical race theory really is. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, critical race theory is a real thing. We're in a law school and it was, you know, it's, it's a legal theory and it, it's just kind of irrelevant to this. They don't, basically what the legislation doesn't want is teaching that takes racism seriously as part of American history and life. But of course, if they said that, they, that doesn't sound as good. If they passed a law saying, we don't want people to say that racism is important you know, that's not gonna get past the legislature. But if you call it critical race theory. Now, a lot of the, the, the legislation, I think only a minority of the bills actually mention critical race theory. 
So a lot of them like spell out things that they don't like, but they don't call it critical race theory. But in terms of the way it's played in the public, and I'm sure you've seen, you've got all these people, you know, in rural Virginia with a sign, don't lay critical race theory on my kid. You know, these people only heard of critical race theory three seconds ago, right. but it's getting them to sort of come out for that. So, you know, I'm not an expert on critical race theory, so I'm not gonna answer the substantive <laughs> part of your question, but I wanted to put that out there. Yeah, this is to your point about out-of-school resource disparities. Um, and I think in understanding that structural barriers, like structural resource barriers to generational wealth um, are definitely impacting educational outcomes. I'm just curious as to what you think a solution to that looks like. like. Are we talking about monetary reparations? Are we talking about improving housing? Or do you think that this civic education and these educational goods could eventually rectify things? Uh, I just wondered what you think the solution is, or if you think civic education could eventually rectify that, or if it's something monetary that it's okay. okay. Great. Thanks, thanks for asking that. No, I don't think, I don't in any way think civic education can address the resource topic, except in a very indirect way that you're hopefully helping students, you know, to understand these systemic things and so on. But I, I really want to distinguish the civic part of the argument from the resource inequality part of the argument. So asking what we do about those things, um, you know, an amazing thing about the moment we live in is that the mainstream of the Democratic Party is in favor of an agenda that would actually do something about those disparities. Now, it might not be enough to get anything passed, but it's the first time in the last 60 years or something that that's been the case. And I do think that, you know, housing, health, all of those things, they don't, they don't deal with the um, opportunity hoarding top thing, but they deal with the disadvantages, you know, at the, at the lower rungs. And uh, in terms of what to do about the disparities at the, t at the top, I mean, I think that if, if the inequality was less crazy than it is in this country that it would i'm not sure about i and i'm sort of aware of this as a problem we argue if i may um that i think if, if inequality were less extreme there would be sort of less extreme opportunity hoarding as well but i don't completely know the answer to that i mean you know since the coleman report came out there's been so much more work done on how advantaged families translate their economic advantages into educational advantages. So like one thing that happened is that, um, you know, families, upper, upper income families became more committed to using their resources for educational benefit for their kids. So that's sort of independent of the actual income. And that's the thing which, once it starts, it might have a kind of autonomy from its origins that's then harder to put that genie back, back in the bottle. You know, of course, the case of the Varsity Blues case is the most kind of striking example, you know, where these parents bought their kids, you know, way in with these coaches and all that kind of thing. Um, and that kind of, you know, that kind of, it's just the tip of the iceberg what those were doing. There's some version that's not illegal that <laughs> millions more engage in. Uh, and, you know, I would hope that there would be some norm setting thing where people wouldn't. I mean, I wish that we could put the genie back in the bottle a little bit and that wealthy people would just not be so laser focused on what's going to help my kid in the education competition. But you know, I, I just put that out as a hope. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think in an ideal sense, this is a great theory, but then I think about like in actuality, the trade-offs much must be much larger for students of color, particularly brown and black students and white students. And like this, this goal that you talk about with mutual respect. No, no, I'm sorry. I, I think that the trade-off, uh, I think white students would benefit a lot more from integration than students of color. I feel like this uh -huh. mutuality of respect that you describe is primarily for white students. 
is what I'm hearing. Yeah, right. Yeah, great. That's a great question. I do think that the um, that the civic benefits that I talked about are are sort of as it were more valuable for the white students. Not that the white students or their friends would necessarily recognize that value immediately, but that we can say, well, it's better to grow up being someone who understands about racism than someone who doesn't understand about racism. Not everyone thinks that's a benefit, you know, so just that's that's one point that I want to put out there. But also because whites, from a racial point of view, you know, whites are the most powerful group. The attitudes of the younger members of that group do matter to people of color as well. So there's some indirect benefit to the students of color. Nevertheless, I basically agree with the asymmetry, and I'm I'm really glad you I'm glad you brought that up. But I do think that there's some there's some aspects of the kind of interracial educational setting that are also a benefit to the um, students of color, and, you know, partly speaking from my own high school teaching experience here, that they, well, for example, recognizing that white people have sometimes been parts of move, social movements that have primarily aimed at benefiting a certain group of color, and that some white people can be trusted. You know, and will actually put themselves on the line to help. And I think that, you know, social movement education seems to me an important part of this kind of civic education. And in learning about the social movements and the building of those social movements, the social movements have both a kind of in-race dimension and they often have a cross-race racial dimension as well. And, uh, Learning about the interaction between people of different racial backgrounds inside those movements, I think, is valuable to the students of color too. But let me just, on your initial point about the asymmetries, it's a, another place to see that is that there can be civic education that goes on in an all BIPOC school, or all one race school, all black, school, all you know that. In, involves those groups, students from those groups agitating on behalf of justice-based concerns that apply to their group. So like in Boston a couple of years ago, there was a mobilization of students in the Boston public school system across a lot of different schools that was challenging the funding formula that, you know, how, how, how funds were distributed among, among different schools. And of course, they're so they, they have a justice framing of that issue, but it's, they themselves are primarily the beneficiaries of it. So that's something that you, there's no analogy for an all white school. There's no racial justice thing that is gonna benefit them. And so that's another sense in which some of the important civic um, educational tasks can go on in all quote unquote minority schools, and they can go on in an all white school. And they, they can go on in an all minority school and also go on in a mixed school, but they can't go on in an all white school. So that's another uh, Um, You mentioned affirmative action and how they kind of use diversity as like the justification and goal. And in our class, we talked about how um, arguments and like justifications for affirmative action don't consider past or present injustices as like uh, a viable like justification for affirmative action. So do you think diversity is enough to achieve like educational and like, educational equality like enough of a goal or do we have to include the nuance of past and present injustices and like reparations to achieve like educational? Well so just to put a little historical context in the Bakke decision if I'm not mistaken I, I could Correct. I think that the dissenting opinion, the minority opinion, embraced a reparations based argument. And then, because it was five to four, you know, basically Powell said, that was not going to work for me. And the other four didn't even want to, you know. So, um, so, I, so I think the, the reparations argument 
was there at the Supreme Court level, and then it just kind of is hardly there at all. But you're asking a normative question. I don't, I think diversity is at a very thin, you know, uh, tool or, or lever to have really substantial change. And I think in some ways, the whole diversity framework has actually diverted from the reparations framework. So that people now think, you know, because the Supreme Court said this, this argument is okay with us, that one isn't. So understandably, institutions are gonna go for the one that the court said is okay. But then that changes the discourse across that whole sector and now people often think that diversity just is the true way to understand why we should give, we should pay attention to race in, in relation. So I think that's really unfortunate. It's better than not having it at all, but it's it's a real problem. Does, does that address what you Yeah, that's, thank you. Thanks, Larry. Um, so I have a question about a prior problem that seems to me, which is that I think if I could speak broadly about society, I think society is trying to use school integration because society seems determined to resist residential um uh, oh, sorry, it's the last thing. Okay. Am I too do I need to do that? Yeah, it's just a, it's a little hard for me to okay. Um, I'm saying that I think in some cases American society has decided that it's going to use school in integration because it's um, incredibly resistant to residential integration. So how do you see those being related? Yeah, okay, that's great. That's a great question. I mean, uh, yes, you can some you can have school integration with neighborhood segregation by sit, you know putting the schools in places where the draw from from different populations. And I, I agree with you that that Americans are much more, you know, I mean, who, who you live with in your neighborhood is different from who you go to school with. I think I would wanna add that another reason that is somewhat related why Americans go for the integration solution is that it does, it's a costless solution doesn't require anybody to cough up any money or to change the resources around. And I, I guess that's sort of a different point from who you want to live with in your neighborhood. But I think both of those reasons are operating to make, uh, you know, school, quote, desegregation an important uh, issue that a lot of people embrace. I do think COVID has rightly pushed aside the integration solution because clearly it's totally irrelevant to the issues that COVID, COVID unearthed. And, um, you know, in a way, I think that there's, I don't think that, <laughs> I don't think that that many people in the US are now really embracing integration in a, in a full, way anymore. I think it sort of has weakened over the years, over the decades as a solution. Um, but, you know, because I think that integration is good, but just for a different reason than the usual reason, you know, I, I'm very ambivalent about, I mean, I don't think it's good if people are just all in separate, separate schools. And you, you could make a somewhat similar argument about residential integration, that it has certain educative and civic benefits um, that, that all, you know, that the neighborhoods of all one race don't have. But on the other hand, you know, a lot of Black people, a lot of Black people, if I'm remembering the polling data on this, a lot of Black people want to live in, a, in an integrated neighborhood, but one that's a primarily Black neighborhood, which is you know, when white people think about integrated neighbors, that's the way they, they think about it also. But obviously, you, could, you, you, you can't have a solution that has every neighborhood have the exact <laughs> proportion of a racial group live in it, and it wouldn't be good. It would be impossible to do anyway, but it also wouldn't really be a, a good idea either. 
Um, so relating to the aspect of teaching this civic engagement, like with critical race theory, what's preventing um, parents who are like um, advantaged students from people who are more hesitant to that kind of education from just moving to like private schools? Like how do we ensure that that method of education and that method of integration is actually being taught, especially to the groups of people who may be more resistant to it in the first place? Well, you know, this legislation, that's precisely what they're trying to keep from happening. They don't want it to be tough for people who don't want to have it. And they they frame it as almost like a kind of parental right, parental rights issue is like incredibly dangerous, even independent of the whole race thing. The idea that parents should be able to dictate to teachers the, who are the professionals who understand that. I mean, I think there's a, I'm sorry, I'm drifting off here, but that, um, there's a tremendously anti-teacher and anti-professional dimension to this legislation. And the whole parent rights thing is really one manifestation of that. Like, we know better what our kids need than, than you do. So, you know, in these states, uh, it, it's not as if the, the private schools... So you're, you're saying... Um, Legislation that governs the public schools won't govern private schools. And so people could go to, you're, you're kind of envisioning the case where a parent whose kids in a public school where they're teaching anti-racist education doesn't like that. So if they have the money to do it, they can go to a private school. There's nothing in our system. You can, those are two different systems. And there's, you know, the, you can only hope that the private schools and, you know, some private schools are progressive in their curriculum, even if they have this, you know, class dimension to them. But they're, they're just, I just don't think there's much that can be done. I think we just have to somehow stop these things from getting out of the gate. I mean, there's one, uh, the state of Oklahoma, there has been a suit brought by, I think it's parents and the ACLU against the state's legislation. So that's the one place I know that there's been some pushback. Presumably, both the, the teachers unions and groups like the ACLU and you know many other kind of professional academic groups and other education-oriented groups uh, recognize how dangerous this is and they're trying to mobilize themselves and I'm just hoping that it's only a matter of time before we see a, a kind of legal pushback against, uh, against these things. But, you know, in states where the Republicans really control the legislature, and it's just a question of what, and, and control the governorship. Um, I mean, I think there's one, there's one state where the governor was a Democrat and the mm -hmm. legislature is Republican, where they passed it. And I, th I think this is right, that the, that the governor, vetoed it and they didn't have enough to override. But it just shows the importance of, of, of elections. <laughs> so kind of bringing that um, asymmetry question back, I've been thinking about the intersection between that asymmetry and the classism and that class slant. And so just to kind of put it into like a vision of a high school classroom, I'm envisioning where we have the, like the white students who let's, most of them are more privileged when it comes to economics. So let's imagine that they are higher class than the people of color and they are benefiting from having more diverse conversations. But then I'm seeing people of color, again, statistically, not going to be of high class. And we obviously see how much that impedes their education already. And so now we have two groups in a room where one, is just naturally benefiting based off of their position in life and the other group is not. And I don't see how, I, I see the group of white students almost in a way becoming like in a white savior type of way learning from the people of color because they don't already, they, are, they already don't really get to learn of the same fluidity that white students do. And then I almost wonder, would that make the people of color in the room feel a further sense of defeat that they already feel? So I just wonder what you think the intersection is there. 
So I missed one part of your question, which was about what was banned for the students of color in the class. Yeah, I, I want to almost describe it as they are being used as a spectacle for the white students to learn from. Yeah. Um, you know, that can definitely, that can definitely happen. And the thing that you said at the end about how it almost like adds insult to injury, that they feel like the white students go out and get to virtue signal and say, oh, I'm in this integrated place. I'm so hip about race and all that. That, you know, that's, that's a terrible effect of this. And I'm putting my hope in teachers creating an atmosphere in the class where everyone feels they have something to learn from each other. And that means that the students of color have something to learn from the white students as well, even if the white students often say stuff that's like really ignorant and off the wall. Um, that's true of you know any any subject you could have, but you know your your point is right that if you're a member of a group that that other person is ignorant about, it can harm you in a way that's different from if you don't get a math, if you don't understand the math problem, and you know that identity dimension of these things is a real it's a real complexity that teachers have to take account of. But I just don't want to think of a classroom as simply a space where one group is simply just saying their experience. The other group is learning something from that. I mean, I think the students of color, if, if you've got a curriculum that's the right kind of curriculum, they're also learning from that. They don't know everything. They might know their own experience. They don't know everything about the historical and social dimension of What's happened to their to their groups? They're more likely to know about that than white students, but they don't always know it. I mean, I just remember, you know, in 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 my own class, um, it was a minority, it was a minor, minority white class, and there was, you know, there was that element of some of the students of color trying to figure out what they were getting that they didn't already know. So like we studied about slavery and the, the students of the black students didn't want other people to think, oh, it's about slavery. So you know about, you know, what happened, you know, so like we read this slave narrative of, of a woman in Bermuda, Mary Prince, you know, nobody knew Mary Prince before this. And so I think it's important to, for the students of color to also not be tagged as the expert in some area like that, that, that kind of reduces the, you know, the fact that it's like a learning space for them also. But you know, I, I, didn't, I, I realize I don't have a, a simple answer to your thing. I just, I'm hoping that the teachers are sort of aware of it. And you know, if, if a, a school district really embraced this anti-racist educational program, civic program, you would be having conversations among teachers where they'd say, this thing happened in my class, and they'd be talking to each other. And over time, they would really develop a lot of kind of pedagogical strategies for how to do it. And if you have professional development set up sort of in the right way in a district, and you know, there are some districts that are definitely doing this, they're really helping their faculty become skilled anti-racist uh, educators. I think that's that's my hope. Um, in addition to the implementation of civic education in schools, and also just like you said, the training of teachers, the aspects um, kind of mental deciding these races, conversations of racism. I was wondering, you said before that you would hope more white parents get to consider just past their children's education. And can you hear me? Well? No, no, I missed the last sentence. Your okay. Last um, you said before how you would hope that more white parents would begin to look past just their children's education careers. And I was just wondering on the concept of like white saviorism, does this imply that um, increased quality of education for BIPOC groups rely on the action of white people? I see. So you're, you're asking whether, um, are, are you almost saying, it's 
it's like can corrupt the education of the BIPOC students, BIPOC students to even have the white students there because of these yucky ways that the white students can can go with what's going on in that class? Um, it sounds uh, more so in, my, in a lot of the literature and discussing racism has been, it should be separated in groups. So you should have the people of color here and you should have the white people here and it should not be um, any BIPOC person's responsibility to educate the person, um, the white person on this, but more so just a narrative on, is it, does it take the action of white folks to increase the quality of education for BIPOC groups? Well, the issue of, of doing sort of like targeted separation, you know, somehow dividing the class up, um, I mean, I think there could be some positive use of that. I wouldn't <laughs> want it to kind of dominate the, the interaction of the class because I do think kind of learning to, to talk across those boundaries is, is, uh, is really important. Um, in terms of the quality of the education, yeah. I mean, you know, we, we talk about it in the book, there, there's this famous um, a Native American school. I can't remember which group it was connected with. It might have been the Navajo, I'm not sure. But it was like this really fabulous school that, you know, really centered on education about that group and about Native Americans were, or generally. And it would be very difficult to have something like that happen in a mixed, in a mixed school. You could have a lesser version of it. You know, you can learn that history, but there is something distinctive. And I just think there's a trade-off in terms of educational values that not all educational values can be realized, you know, equally in every demographic situation. So that's why we do want to leave room in the book for, positive value attached to, you know, a school that's all one group. And that's, that's the, you know, part of the pluralist idea that we sort of hold on to. Um, yeah. Um, you mentioned a bit back that, um, it's hard to affect change uh, at local levels because of like government legislatures um, being more Republican in some states such as Virginia. Um, to what extent do you think that Supreme Court and federal legislation, Supreme Court decisions and federal legislation can affect um, educational change? <laughs> For example, like with the Brown versus Board of Ed case, it took like 10 years to affect actual change. So are, are you asking a more general question about how, what's the impact of like, Supreme Court decisions. Like in, or, in such a tenuous case, like with so many people opposing so-called critical race theory, do you think that, to what extent do you think Supreme Court case decisions in favor of more, I guess, integrated or racially minded like classroom teaching would be effective um, like in good faith at a school level? Well, there's a lot of distance between you know that ruling, and then what goes on in the trenches of a given of a given district. I do think that, for example, if the Supreme Court had ruled the other way in the Picks decision, the Picks decision restricted the ability of a district to assign students to more to create a set of more mixed schools. The Supreme Court said you you can't do you can do that, but you can't do it by using the racial identity of students in your assignment policy. But if the ruling had gone the other way and Breyer's opinion had been the, the ruling opinion, I think that would have really been good because it would have validated the, you know, it would have validated partly the reparations framework. So it would have legitimized that as something. He didn't say we should also teach this reparations framework. He was saying the reparations framework should be understood by us as part of the reason for having mixed, uh, mixed classes. But 
if you validate it as a kind of publicly acceptable idea, I think that it's then easier for teacher groups to embrace, te you know, progressive teacher caucuses within teacher groups. So, you know, there are sort of steps by which what goes on on the ground can, can be positively uh, affected. But, you know, with the current Supreme Court, of course, almost, it's almost all in the wrong direction. So then, of course, that's another question, like how, I mean, I don't know if any of these um, anti-racist cases are ever going to get to the Supreme Court. And I, you know, it would, I don't even want to think about it. But, um, uh, you know, I, I just don't know what, it, it's really hard to imagine because it's just happening at this level. And it's so insane that it's like, I can't even wrap my mind around it to plug it into the very good question that you're asking me. Um, okay, so when you're explaining the laws of educational inequalities, when you're identifying the, the in school disparities versus the. No, no, sorry. Uh, so when you're talking about the cause for educational inequalities and you like differentiate between the in school resource disparities and then like out of school causes of educational inequality, is it kind of possible that the in school resource disparities are still because of the out of school? differences in like economic inequality and stuff because if property taxes are like causing disparities or whether kids are going to private schools things like that isn't that just doesn't that just have to be addressed by the same things like reparations or whatever social program that is addressing the out of school disparity yeah well i mean in a way there are two somewhat different tracks that and the, the in-school disparities, and you know, I was just pointing to the property tax as a, as a problem, but um, in fact, you, you don't want, if you have a clay stratified society, it wouldn't be enough to give every school, as it were, the same amount of money per student, because it costs more to educate the more disadvantaged. So you, you would have to do what they, what they do in Finland, which is, to get more money to the schools serving the more disadvantaged populations, and then hopefully that lifts them up. And you know, so what it would take to create, you know, what I'm calling the in-school resources, what it would take to create a kind of egalitarian thing wouldn't be an equal amount of resources. It would be a differential amount of resources, but it would take to need. But then you know, the out of school things, uh, you know, as long as you have that class stratification, you, you're going to have opportunity hoarding by, by the wealthy. And so you can't, you know, you can't get total equality just from the in school resources alone. And that is going to be a problem that, you know, we, we talked about earlier. Um, I, I don't know how to exactly solve that one. It's just that. It's better to have a less unequal, more unequal situation. So you talked earlier about how we can't really uh, test for the, the provision, the successful provision of the civic and moral goods of education. Um, of course, I, I mean, I get that, but I, I wonder whether there are any empirical studies that are being conducted, developed, designed in order to test the successes of anti-racist education in schools and what they look like, what they look at in order to look at the positive impact of that education. There's a little bit of um, um, data on anti-racist sensitivity training in the workplace, which show that they make things worse rather than better. That doesn't show there shouldn't be any, that shows maybe they're badly delivered, badly designed and so on. But yeah, are, are there efforts to like kind of back with data, the efforts of anti-racist educators? I don't know the answer to that. I'm afraid I don't know. I mean, there's this, this outfit at Tufts it's a civic education outfit. I'm blanking on the name of it right now. I, I imagine that they're tuned into a kind of broader question of the efficacy of different civic approaches. But in terms of the more particular issue of anti-racist teaching, I'm just, I, I 
I just don't know enough <clears throat> philosopher. I, you know, I just don't know enough about the empirical lay of the land in the education things that, you know, randomly come across my desk. I haven't seen anything like that. Um, but I do, I have the impression that after George Floyd and the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, uh, many more teachers decided that they wanted to engage in anti-racist education than had done so before. So that was fairly recently, wouldn't be enough time to have, have tested it. Um, and there's another, there's another outfit in, in Boston called Facing History in Ourselves. Did any of you take a Facing History in Ourselves course? In, oh, okay. It's a, it's a national group, but it's based in Brookline, and they have an anti-racist component, and they have some research dimension. And, uh, you know, that might be a place where I, I could look. But I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, um, I'm just uh, having trouble understanding like so who does the burden fall on is it on the, the teachers is it on the BIPOC students because to me it seems like it's anyone but the white students and so it kind of seems like there's no like really effort on behalf of the privilege to kind of attain this like you know what I'm saying I see I see Okay, so um, two, two stages in the answer to that. So the, I don't think that any student has a responsibility to educate another student, but they do have everyone, all the students in a class, in my ideal classroom here, have a responsibility to participate in a process from which hopefully everyone benefits. But it would really be a mistake to think this group of students has an, has an obligation to educate that group of students. Now, the thing is though, you know, you and some of the other questions, um, questioners asked whether um, it might feel to the BIPOC students as if they are being said to be uh, responsible for educating. And I think that the teacher really has to make clear that that's, that's kind of not the case. So it's like on the burden of the teacher to like kind of facilitate that. Yes, yeah, it's, it's totally. I mean, you know, when, when I was teaching in high school, some of the students would say that when, when a racial issue came up in another class, often the teacher might have ideally wanted to carry the conversation forward, but didn't feel capable of doing it, didn't feel that he or she had the skills to, to do that. So, you know, I think that in order for that responsibility to mean something, the teachers really have to learn how to manage racial conversations. And it's very hard to do it. It's very, it's very complicated. And is that the state that does that? Like, so I just like understanding the mechanism of it. Is it the state's burden to teach like an education system where the teachers are equipped enough to be able to facilitate those discussions so that students don't feel like they are having to. Yeah, that, that, that's kind of a, a level that I hadn't quite thought about before, but yes, you know, there's a licensure, you know, system mm -hmm. and you could build into that, that a core part of what every teacher who's gonna go out there knows how to do is a certain level of racial literacy to have a certain degree of racial literacy that maybe they can be tested on, but also to have the abilities to run conversations that kids, the kids bring up. I mean, my experience was that students of all races were really happy to have a space where race was taken seriously as being like chemistry and math. It was as important as chemistry and math to learn about race. And so it was important to me to call the course race and races. I mean, it was a, it's a fairly progressive but public high school, and many of them had studied racial things in, uh, you know, like African American literature or American history. Um, but, but anyway, I, I do think that it's important to build in, in a way that you're suggesting, somehow in, in the, both in the licensing, but then of course that affects ed schools. 
So ed schools have to be able to be teaching this stuff. And maybe they are, I just don't know enough now. Maybe, I mean, I imagine that, you know, some of the people who I see writing are also teaching and they're probably mm -hmm. teaching courses on this kind of thing, but I don't know that everyone has to take it or, you know, what it's level. But on, on another aspect of your question, which is, um, you, you don't want white students to just think, okay, this is my course on race. So uh, I'm gonna sit here and then you feed me stuff and yeah. I'll learn that. You want white students to feel that they have to be proactive mm -hmm. in learning about racial things. And they can't just like go to some classmate of theirs who's black and say, you know, yeah. tell me what it's like to be black or something. Yeah. That, and I think that the teachers can have some role in encouraging this, but it's gotta be something that the families are also on board with, you know, that when the student is, is reading things, you know, the, their choices of what they want to read on their own or what websites they look at on their own would be somewhat informed by a sense, well, really, I should be trying to learn some of these things that I don't know because I grew up in this white bubble. And, you know, that, that notion of responsibility is somewhat of a departure from a traditional way of thinking about the teaching relationship. So I'm not quite sure how to... <coughs> Yeah. tie the pieces together, but hopefully there's some way to do that. Yeah. We're about out of time, but let's just thank this book. Professor Patricia Williams are teaching a course on philosophy of race and racism next semester, which you should all take. <laughs> She's teaching a course in the No, the two of us are teaching. Oh, you're teaching with me. Oh, yeah, you I think like no, so maybe I'm not. Oh, you guys are Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't hear what you're saying. Well, I don't know how long we can get that thing, Robert. But, like, can we go quick? I don't know. I don't know what he's doing. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Where is he? I think he's on the thing now. Oh, I'm like, it's like kind of an uneven split of work. It's like the entire spectrum. I don't know what he's doing. I'm going to stop.